parables, and today our parable is going to be out of Luke chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 1 if you want to join us in the scripture there. The parables in scripture are stories told by Jesus, but they're not just stories for entertainment. They are stories teaching a spiritual message or point. We've had the parable of the seeds or the sower, and that's right there behind us in glass, which teaches us that we must be connected deeply in the soil of God to produce his fruit. If not, we'll be distracted by the world and follow God. We also read the parable of the Good Samaritan, and in that parable we learned that God is calling us to be a neighbor to everyone, including the people who don't like us. By doing this, we show God we love him because his law hinges on loving him and loving others. And truly, when we love others, as Christ calls us to, then we are showing love to God. So today, par the parable, Luke 14, we're going to call it the great banquet. It's going to be Luke 14, verse 1, it starts like this. It happened when he went to the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, now that he is Jesus, on the Sabbath to eat bread. They were watching him closely, and there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, I love the scripture. I hope you know that about me. It's one of my favorite things. But I just really like how Jesus jumps right in. These stories, they don't take much time to develop. We're in it. So here we are. Jesus never seems to waste time or an opportunity to teach people. And that includes us since we're reading it now. Jesus is at a dinner party with the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees are a super religious group. They know the scripture better than anybody else, except for maybe the lawyers uh, in that culture. So they're observing, observing the Sabbath together. And that happens every week. They've got the Sabbath. These guys are, are gathered together. And presumably the leader of the Pharisees, or a leader amongst the Pharisees, has invited Jesus to join them. Now, they have sort of a fascination with Jesus. He's this great teacher. He knows a lot of things, but he's kind of a wild card to them. And so they have this maybe morbid fascination. Really what they want to do is catch Jesus doing something he shouldn't be doing. So they're really watching him closely. They're not relaxed around him. Like if you were at a party with your friends, you're just going to be relaxed. You're going to enjoy it. But they're really just watching what Jesus is going to do. Now, in walks this man, and we hear that he's suffering from dropsy. Today, we call that edema, which is a filling of fluid of the human body. So this man was literally like waterlogged. He must have been swollen, must have been really painful. But he is coming in to see Jesus, which is the right thing to do. But he is coming to see Jesus on the Sabbath. Okay, now we're starting to go, okay, well, is that okay? Is that not okay? And not only that, it just so happens that he's coming to see Jesus on the Sabbath where Jesus is in front of this Pharisee group. These guys know the law in and out, and in walks this man. Now, everybody in this crowd, the Pharisees, are very concerned with keeping every single rule that there is about the Sabbath, both man-made and given by God. So there is tension in the air, probably, as this is happening. Now, of course, we know there's no coincidence with God. Or I hope you know that. It's not a coincidence that in walks this guy in the middle of this crowd amidst the one group that's going to be very particular about the Sabbath. Now, maybe this is not blowing your mind, but let's think about it this way. If a man wearing a beer t-shirt walks into a bar, is anybody going to notice? Not really. 
So if this man with edema walks into a group of people that are the riffraff of society, sinners, you know, the outcasts, nobody's really going to care that he's there on the Sabbath. They should probably be happy that he's there. Now, if we have the man in the beard t-shirt walk into a Baptist seminary class, he's going to get some looks, right? Okay. So this is the kind of feeling that we should be having right here. This guy with edema is walking in late to this Sabbath meeting with all these Pharisees who were on time, dressed properly, ready to go for this. And in walks this man. He's got everybody's attention. Now, Jesus is going to lead out with just a simple question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Okay, so you and I are probably like, well, uh, uh, you probably have some thoughts, so let's, let's think about this. Right now, how do you feel should Jesus be healing on the Sabbath or not? A pretty easy answer, right? Hey, I thought you'd say that. Now, okay, let's make it a little more difficult here. Well, let's say your mom has cancer, or your child has seizures, or your coworker has kidney failures. Should Jesus be healing on the Sabbath? Yeah, okay, so we're fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. He can heal. That's fine. Right? We're okay with it. And, and that's a question we answer with ease. I mean, everybody's on the same page here. Yes, please. We desperately want that healing. We want it now. We want to see our friends, our family members, our coworkers. We want them healed. We don't want them struggling anymore. Okay, so that's straightforward. But then again, let's hold up a second, because we as a culture don't celebrate the Sabbath at all. That's something we don't do. And I want to remind you, God is very interested all throughout Scripture with the idea of Sabbath. In fact, he started the concept by himself taking a Sabbath on the seventh day of creation. He started there. He created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Not because God was tired, right? He's not worn out because he made the earth. He's God. He didn't need the rest. So why would he do that? He set it up for us. And we see that as we go throughout Scripture in Exodus and following. It says, the Lord God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh, so you should do the Sabbath, and so on. And as we see, it doesn't end there. Even in the New Testament, we see this Sabbath rest, and we don't want to get too far outside of our parable, but I just want to prove the point is that we don't focus on it. But we should. Are you taking a Sabbath? Are you resting? Or are you too busy with work, kids baseball, home projects? Uh, do you take a Sabbath rest? You should. Now, in the nation of Israel, let's go back there because that's where our story is, it was unlawful to break the Sabbath. If you broke God's Sabbath law, you could be cut off from the nation of Israel or even killed for it. So it is a big deal, and it was a law given by God himself. The Pharisees knew this, and they are observing the Sabbath, and they even added some modifications, which was not okay. But they really were in it, and uh, any time that we see somebody want to modify Scripture for their own benefit, that's very dangerous territory. That puts our ideas on the same plane as God's ideas. And do we know better than God? No. So is it lawful to he heal on the Sabbath? When Jesus asks them this question, they don't know the answer. You guys are like, yes, let's heal. And I'm with you. We want to see healing on the Sabbath. But these guys, they don't know. So what, what do they do? Verse 4, they kept silent. And he, Jesus, took hold of the man with edema and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you who will have a son or an ox fall into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could make no reply on this. 
You see, because they are interested in the bits of the law and the things that they were doing for their own benefit and missing the point. Jesus points out that basic needs should be met. If your son's trapped in the well, you should help him. You should have compassion over sacrifice. You should be willing to help those in need, including this sick man on the Sabbath. That's the point Jesus is making. You should love your neighbor as yourself, and that is a way that we can show to love God. That is extremely important, but the Pharisees are dumbfounded. They can't even imagine what God is talking about. They cannot even reply to Jesus. So Jesus continues, because he's really going to teach them what is important here. He says in verse 7, he began speaking a parable to the invited guests. And he noticed that they had been picking out places of honor at the table and saying to them, when you're invited to the place of honor at the table, uh, sorry, uh, when you've been invited to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited. And he who invited both of you will come to say, give up your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you'll proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who invites you comes, he says, friend, move up higher. You will be honored in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a pretty big common Jesus phrase here. It's like, uh, what exactly did he say? But he's saying that we need to have the attitude of a servant. We need to be humble. We need to be seeking after what God would truly want. And we will be exalted for that. So when we're proud and we're calling attention to ourselves, we are going to be humbled instead. And he also went on to say to one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or brothers or relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, you may also be invited in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Since they do not have means to repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now Jesus is continuing in teaching the religious elite of the day. He's staring at a room full of Pharisees. It'd be like sitting around a table with a bunch of pastors. Would you feel theologically intimidated? You might. But Jesus is there criticizing their actions. And guess what? Pastors need it. We all need Jesus to call us out when we get things wrong. And guess what? We're people. We get it wrong. The Pharisees, the religious elite, the lawyers, they get called out by Jesus. And the parable calls us out because we can get fooled in the way that we think. The world is so distracting to us. We get caught up thinking like everybody else. This is the popular thought of the day. It's got to be right. Does it? This is what everybody else is doing. I should do it too. Should you? Just because everybody else is doing it? Just remember what the prophet Jeremiah said. The heart is deceitful. So when we follow our feelings... We can follow our way into deceit. So Jesus has been giving some classic thoughts to these men. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. Don't press your rights to be first because someone else will be honored over you and you'll be embarrassed. Don't look out for only those who can pay you back. Earthly pay and earthly rewards that you will get are only momentary. Wouldn't you rather receive repayment from God at the final resurrection of the righteous? I think so. Then do as he asks. Help the poor, help the lame, help the blind, help the homeless, help the outcasts, orphans and widows. You love God by loving others. And Jesus isn't finished with these guys yet. One of the guys who thinks he knows what Jesus is talking about says in verse 15, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Hey, it's all right. If we're all going to be there together, we'll be blessed. But he said to him, a man's giving a big dinner, and he's invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave out to say to those who have been invited, come, for everything is ready. 
This is pretty straightforward, right? This man is like, yeah, we're going to eat bread in the kingdom of God together. And we're going to be blessed. Well, I think, yes, if we are in the kingdom eating bread with God, that is a blessing. The man is definitely feeling, who is a Pharisee, he's saying, I'm going to be one of those people. So Jesus is taking the opportunity to start the parable here to warn people from assuming that we are going to be eating bread with God at the great feast of heaven. Who's going to make it then? So Jesus starts telling the story of a dinner party. He's invited many people, and remember, parables are always relevant. The parable is about eating and a dinner party, and don't we still do that? We still eat? We still throw dinner parties? So pretty smooth story so far. Let's find out, because Jesus always likes to throw some twists in there. Verse 18, but they all alike begin to make excuses. Remember, he's invited them through a servant. They all begin to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a piece of land and I need to go look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I've married a wife and for this reason I cannot come. Now we see people are either unable or are refusing to come to this dinner party. And there are varying levels of good and bad excuses. I think the best excuse here might be the man who's, you know, saying, I've just married a new wife. In the Bible, the man was supposed to devote the first year to his wife's happiness. So this is maybe a legitimate excuse, right? Just one year, that's all you ladies get, by the way. <laughs> just one. <laughs> the others as we can see, are just excuses. Good excuse or not, the people aren't coming. And perhaps we've all been there as the person giving the party where you invite people and they can't make it. How do we feel? Well, the story continues on. The slave came back and reported to the master that these people are making excuses. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out into the streets and lanes of the cities. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And now we're getting into kind of a weird situation. I don't think any of us do this, right? We've got a dinner party. There are eight chairs still open. Well, just go out in the street and start inviting people in. I saw that guy with the cardboard sign on the corner. Just grab him. Let him come in. Go down to the hospital. Grab him out. Bring him in, right? We don't do that. That's strange, and so this is a reminder that Jesus is really trying to teach us something deeper than just what's on the surface here, right? But the party giver is angry. And can you blame him? All the preparations would go to waste if the people don't come. So he sends out, sends out his slaves to invite all sorts of people. Initially, the man probably had invited the best and the brightest, right? That's what we do. Our friends, our close people the most upwardly mobile, the cool, the popular, the who's who. But now he's been soundly rejected by those people, so he starts inviting the nobodies, the uncool, the awkward, the undesirable. And the slave says to the master, verse 22, Master, what you've commanded has been done, and there's still room. Master says, go out into the highways and along the hedges, and if you've seen, oh brother, where art thou? You're singing that now. Uh, compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. And now we're really starting to get in there, right? The master still has room in his house, sends the slave even farther out. The second group of second raiders at least would have been known to the master, right? He was living in town. I know this guy, he, he likes to be here. I didn't want him the first time. So they start inviting those people he knows, and now it's like, we got more seats. Just go out and get whoever will say yes and bring them in. Do we fill a party that way? No. So again, this is going to a spiritual point. The original guest could not be bothered to show up, and now the master is filling it with whoever will say yes. 
Well, great story, Jesus. What does it mean? Well, there is a similar parable in Matthew 22 about a wedding feast, and it really helps us identify the characters. In our story, it just says the man is having a party, right? So it could be any man. But in the similar story in Matthew 22, it's really a king who is giving a wedding feast in honor of his son. Now we start to see that this is a spiritual story, right? The king sends his slaves to invite many people to come. And in Matthew, when they refuse to come, they actually start mistreating the slaves and beating them up and killing some of them. This is pretty dramatic. And the king in that story sends his army to kill the bad guests. Oh my goodness. But then he invites all the people, just like in this parable. So the similarity here allows us to identify the master and king in both of those stories as God the Father. And he's having a feast for his son, Jesus Christ. And he's inviting people to come to these feasts in both stories. And this parallels the end in Revelation chapter 19. You have the marriage supper of the Lamb. All these stories are going to the same point. At the end of time, Jesus is going to be honored in heaven by his Father, and this is what this story is about. The original guests, in our case, are definitely the Pharisees. Jesus is staring at a room full of Pharisees, and he has the nerve to tell a story to them about themselves. Now, Jesus is telling our parable, so it's applicable directly to them, but it's also applicable to the whole nation of Israel. You see, historically, the nation of Israel was given the ultimate invitation to be the chosen nation of God. And God chose to make his special story known through them. They had a special temple, they were given special attention, special miracles, special prophets. They had special people. They were given the law on tablets written by the finger of God. That is special. They were the invited. But as in the parable, we see historically the nation of Israel was too busy with whatever they were doing to respond well to God's invitation. Now, this can also be applied to modern church. That's us. Maybe not exactly us, but in America, it certainly applies to us, right? If you grow up in church, if you went to Sunday school, if you read the Bible, if your parents are Christians, if you've been here for longer than five minutes, okay, Maybe some of you have been here longer than five years or in church for longer than five years. You're an invited guest, too. You have all the information you need to attend the feast. So this parable can be about us, too. You see, the guests in the parables had the honor of knowing the master. They were given the special invitation to the feast. They had the inside track. They knew all about it. But these were the people who rejected the master, the ones who knew him. Mm. One only has to look at Jewish history to know it's more than a story. How many times did God send his servants, in Israel's case, the prophets, and we have lots of books about those guys, right? They invited the nation back to a right relationship with God, and the truth is God continually warned the people of Israel to repent and follow him. That's an invitation to relationship. And we're not much different. There are Christian churches on every corner in every town in America. Most of them are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have TV shows, radio shows, social media, apps, and more, giving information to people in churches, giving them the invitation to have a relationship with God. Yet here is America, ignoring God completely. 
people who grew up listening to this gospel message have had an invitation and walked away from Jesus Christ, choosing to plow their fields rather than come to Christ's party. This is why the master sends his servants to new people. Who are the new people? Well, for the Jews, the Jewish audience, it was a veiled reference to the Gentiles, who were not the chosen people. The Gentiles were, according to Israel, the riffraff, the unsafe, the unwashed masses, the unclean, right? God doesn't really want to save them, does he? Well, we find scripturally from the book of Acts, that's precisely what God wanted. In fact, he sent his apostles with the message out. Primarily, Paul is a great example. He went to the Gentiles, and the Holy Spirit did a mighty work, and boy, are we glad. Those are our ancestors, right? From people, we received this message. The original invitees rejected him, and the invitation went beyond that. What a precious gift. Well, in the modern case, the invitation still goes out beyond the church, beyond us. Everybody needs to know it. Everybody's got to hear this good news, and that's our job, right? The kingdom of God is open, but you must receive the invitation. If you've never received that invitation, please grab me after the service. I'd be happy to tell you all about that. So this parable really, when you boil it down, isn't a nice story about a party, but it's a story about an invitation, and it is giving us a warning that we need to focus on. We need to know that if we're not careful, we can end up the same as the first guest. We can find ourselves too busy for God's invitation to relationship, just as God's chosen people were too busy. So what do we do about it? Well, God, you need to know that God is preparing a wedding feast for his bride, the church. That's Revelation 19. And since Adam and Eve, we see the story over and over in the scripture that God is pursuing mankind and trying to have a relationship with them. He's been inviting them from the beginning. He's inviting us to follow him, to be more like him, to have that relationship. And we have that same invitation today. So the question is, what are you going to do with that invitation? Are you going to respond to him and therefore attend the banquet? Or are you going to be too busy? See, especially now, when we have a lot going on in America, it's easy to get distracted by other things, just like the people in Jesus' story. There are many opportunities in life that want to take our attention away from God, away from the invitation to life with him, away from the feast. But we must keep our focus. It's like being in a hotel hallway. There are all sorts of doors on each side. At the end is the feast. You can see it. But there are all these distractions all along the way. And we must stay focused on that instead of being distracted by this side and that side and what's going on here. Now, as I was preparing this sermon, I simultaneously was preparing for speaking at Baccalaureate, where I preached the parable of the talents. And I also was thinking about the parable of the seeds that we talked about. And I was struggling in finishing out this sermon because it's like my mind wanted to pull in elements from all these sermons. Uh, that's ridiculous. Let's focus. Get your mind right. We've got to say, what is this parable alone saying? So I wanted to talk about things like spend your life using what God gave you for his glory, but then I thought, no, that's the parable of the talents. Or how do we stay rooted in God? And that's the parable of the seeds. And so I was having this confusion, and I was frustrated because it was like, how do I just apply this one? But then it kind of hit me. All of these parables are really talking about the same thing. Of course the parables are similar because Jesus, in all of the cases, is talking about what the kingdom of God is like and what we should be doing. So it's kind of a silly statement, but it's true. Either you're seeking the kingdom 
and all these parables apply to you or you're not, right? So if we are seeking, seeking the kingdom, then all three parables demonstrate the same thing. You have the opportunity to respond to the invitation to be a servant of the master and be deeply rooted in him. He gives you talents, whether money or otherwise, that you can use in this life to bring him glory, to work for his kingdom and respond to his invitation. The other option is to let things distract you from what's important or let fear keep you from responding to this invitation from God. Each of these parables are all pointing the same direction. Either you're willing to work for God, to be at work doing what he told us to do, to reach out to these people, or you aren't. And there will be consequences depending on your decision. So how are you going to respond? Are you going to accept the invitation? Are you going to be deeply rooted and do what he said? That's the question. Now, it's easy for us to think that when we get to the throne, the great throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, that we're going to have a chat with God and really tell him how that's supposed to go. Well, God, you see, I was really busy with kids' sports, and my InstaChat account was pretty popular, so I uh, spent a lot of time there, and my favorite TV show was on on Wednesday nights, so I had to watch that, and... You know, people were talking around the water cooler, and rather than being nice to others, I was just chatting with them. I know you understand, because you love me, right? So we're really going to stand in front of the almighty God of the universe and tell him how it was. I don't think so. I think at that point, we're going to be face down worshiping him, ruining the wasted time in life that we spent. We're not going to explain to him anything. Our mouth will be mute except for praising him. Now, one thing is for certain. We cannot go backwards and fix the past. But what we can do is devote our future to having that relationship that God is inviting us to. We've been, we could be in the dirt that he's created for us, the good soil, in the word, doing the things he asks, and producing the fruit he wants us to. So are we going to be about that work? Are we going to defend the widow and orphan? Are we going to break bread with the hungry? Are we going to clothe the naked? Or are we going to spend time promoting ourselves? We could speak to others about the good news of Christ and act it out, both word and deed, or we could be about ourselves. Friends, the accounting is coming. The reckoning is coming in life. The invitation is out there. Are you going to respond to it or not? And I think this question should linger pretty heavily today. Today's a special day, if you did not know. Uh, today is, oh gosh, there went the word. Pentecost, thank you. Uh, Pentecost is when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2. And as we think about what God has continually done, he sent his Spirit to move us and to help us reach out to those around us. We have to say, are we responding to God's invitation? 